And Tony is a kind of combination of self-determined, but also open-minded. He's not kind of bloody-minded, this is the way he's going to do it. This is the way he's going to do it, but he's also going to listen to other people. And I find he's one of the few people I know who actually reads the things I recommend and kind of learns from them and comes back and has conversations about that. Um, I think you'll see that that kind of independence of mind, that even the name of the practice is not any of the people who actually work there as partners, but in fact it's the uh, mutual friend who influenced them all, and they decided to take that name and be independent. In many ways you'll see that he does things in a very independent way, but also open to ideas. He's very much concerned with where we are at the moment, this kind of evolutionary moment and how that's going to influence architecture. And I think there'll be lots of resonance between what he talks about and what I've been talking about. Not least, for instance, that architects really seriously undervalue what architecture is and the role of architecture in, in becoming human and in, in advancing the human project. So uh, let's just... I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, it was a pleasure to meet Peter um, and to share so many conversation about our role, our discipline, and the relevance of being human here and now in this moment um, faces such an interesting time. So because we all had slightly different days, some of us might be more stressed, some of us might be more relaxed, you might just have arrived, or you had uh, lots to do today, I would like with a little exercise of grounding and presence, nothing too complicated, just to make sure that we all start from the same position. Um, it's called here and now, and uh, in a very uh, unimaginative way, is about here and now. Um, that's pretty much where you work and study and uh, become an amazing architect. And if we all look at this photograph, we can start to recognize shapes and forms that have a meaning for us. Um, I will start. I can see a railway truck a very precise, very efficient uh, infrastructure. I can see a neatly drawn up framework of roads, public highways, and I can see buildings of various typologies and various ages. I can also see um, a very timid attempt to renewable energy and a scared little explosion of urban green trying to come up from the concrete. Um, I know this part of London. I normally come out here for drinks. Um, and I look at this picture, I'm, I'm quite happy. Perhaps I'm still happy from being here tonight. But if we zoom out, imagine we're floating in midair and we, we elevate our point of view to embrace the entire form, shape, uh, area of East London. Well, suddenly, uh, we can see a few more things. Uh, I can see the green infrastructure, I can see Victoria Park, I can, I can remember perhaps a great moment during a music festival. Uh, I can see other parks, I can see where the bombs fell during the war. I can see the difference in the urban patterns, and yet again I can see the clean, neat, efficient infrastructure of the railway, and another more organic and sensual shape of the waterways. Um, at this height, I am both happy to be part of East London, but I can pick up small elements of anxiety coming from, from the difficulty of finding a home in East London, from the quality of the air that I sometimes have to endure while I cycle around East London. So at this height, my feelings are kind of mixed. We're floating even higher now, so we can see the entirety of London. First of all, I recognize the Thames, which looks some sort of contorted digestive system, which is kind of leaving behind what remains of human activity. Um, and the colors doesn't seem to be particularly encouraging. I can see the Lee Valley, I can see the Olympic Park, I can see again better defined the, the green infrastructure, um, so scattered, I'd say. But mostly, I can see density. It's, it's a bit of a blurred image of, of gray, different urban patterns. And at this scale, I'm kind of facing a different level of emotional reaction. I'm slightly more anxious. Now the housing crisis is fully clear in my 
in my memory and imagination. Also, I cannot avoid thinking of different zones in, in London, the prejudice between north and south, west and east. And London is, is a beautiful and, and fragile and extremely complicated organism that may suffer greatly from the changes our ecosystem is going through. I'm so high now that I can see London as a sort of lost island of grey in a sea of green, far less densely populated. I can see London, the southeast, and I can see the sea. There's the three elements I can see at this height. And somehow, I don't know you, but at this height, I just think of Brexit. I think of how isolated London is politically in terms of what vision Londoners share and what different vision people outside London in the rest of England have. And the elections uh, have given us a very interesting reminder of how different those visions can be. If a zoom even outer, the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the rest of the United Kingdom kind of look to me as fragments of some sort of geological crack, crash, or, or splinter that are drifting away towards um, the north. I can see the rest of Europe. I notice that Switzerland and Sweden have a distinctively darker shade of grey. And it's almost absent in the rest of Northern Europe and completely absent in England. Those are forests. And these are forests. These are mountains covered by woods. Those are wild ecosystems somehow still functioning as they should. The UK looked to me in all their fragility in their lack of resilience to climate change. And as I move out, floating in midair, the British Channel seemed to me almost small, approachable, accessible, easy to bridge. And yet, I can't ignore the number of people, fellow human beings, dead, trying to cross their little bit of water. As I move out even further, the shades of green get mixed up with completely different colors. We got pale beige and little yellows in okra. And that part of my palette reminds me of particularly hostile environment, near total drought, desertification, lack of water. And I can see Syria. I cannot help thinking about the huge number of climate refugees who fled an area which wasn't livable anymore. But also I think that by 2050, I come from Italy, by 2050, half of my own country would be very, very difficult to live in. It would be mostly dry. And so would be the south of Spain, and so would be Greece. So the influx of climate refugees will just increase. So at this height, I am a bit nervous. Uh, I don't think it's vertigo. Um, and also I think of the Gulf Stream, and I've just recently read how the Gulf Stream takes about 1,000 years to do a loop. And this very slow and very important recycling of thermodynamic flows is essential to keep Earth at the right temperature. With increased temperature and increased humidity, the Gulf Stream has slowed down. We don't really know exactly how this is working. But should the Gulf Stream slow down even further, the way Earth rearranges its thermodynamic balance will be further destroyed. Hotter places will be even hotter, and colder places even colder. And then if I zoom out, and we kind of fly together even higher up in the atmosphere, suddenly, I don't know you, but I just think she's beautiful. She's a beautiful pale blue marble, 
And quite frankly, from this distance, it doesn't really matter anymore whether the client is going up one, two, three, four, or eight degrees. We're so high up, we're so disconnected from, <coughs> from the reality of our ecosystems that it just looks beautiful. We think our home is beautiful. And that is a tremendous lie, because this is not our home. We don't inhabit Earth. We inhabit a very, very, very thin and fragile crust which is by 75% covered by water. And the remaining part is not entirely livable. So somehow we should kind of stop referring to our home as this beautiful, perfect blue planet. But think of this. That thin, fragile crust is our home, not the beautiful blue planet. And we up, excuse my French, because I don't really know how to express the feeling um, I have inside. We kind of sped up. In the last 200 years, we sped up growth, we sped up use of fossil fuels, and you know better than me that we kind of sped up. And in the last 20 years, the predictions of the IPCC have proved to be actually too optimistic, too conservative. So what we're facing is actually an even faster process. But how could that happen? How could all of this disaster and catastrophe unfold without any of us being aware and trying to stop it? Maybe some of us were sleeping, but most of us were actually building this new climate regime. Climate change is the logical consequence of our agency on Earth. It's not an incident or an accident. It's the logical consequence. And I believe it's got something to do with this. So climate change, to me, is the effect of a privatization of Earth's assets without taking any liability resulting from the negative externalities of their abuse. So let's say I take a commons property, air, water, or petroleum, I use it, I make a profit out of it, and I take no liability for the consequences of my own production mode. Now, because no one questioned those negative externalities, all of this happened very, very quickly. Before coal, the West was and has advanced and developed in economic growth compared to the rest of the world. It all happened very quickly. And some of us, some of the scientists, some of our friends, refer to the current age in which we live as Anthropocene, the new geological era of men. But is this correct? You see, if I just kind of read that, is, is men, mankind, and their new era. So humanity is responsible for the new geological era. era. Humanity has sub fundamentally change the way the planet works. But I think even that is slightly incorrect. It's not humanity. It's a very, very small group of humanity. And somehow, we all belong more or less to that group. But it's not the entirety. But what's interesting, though, if we dig down deeper behind Anthropocene, we find a quite long and fascinating consequential chain of things that have got to do with us. Behind Anthropocene, we've got climate change. Behind climate change, we've got capitalism. Capitalism is the only way I can ensure access to natural resources without which the economic system doesn't work. And the way I'm going to make sure that nothing stops me between my needs and the resources is colonialism. So everything is connected. London is a very wealthy city. This is a beautiful school because of that. And behind colonialism, there is an ideology because I would do certain things because I uh, agree, I sign up to a certain idea, a certain vision of myself against the others. So we could see this consequential link of events. 
is actually a history. It's a history of othering. Because behind the, ide the ideology that calls colonialism, there is racism. A certain race decided that it was more important, more worth than the others. So it did what they did. And racism is a stupendously clear form of othering. But if we look further inside us and our life and our communities and our families, realize that there is a, an even deeper form of othering. So if we follow back this history of othering, realize that most of us, perhaps not all of us, has something to do with the Abrahamic patriarchy. And by Abrahamic, I mean Christianity, Judaism, Islam, the great, the great three monotheisms. They all are based around the importance of a male figure in the family, in the community, at the center of the church. So this long history of othering has to start somewhere. And I think it kind of starts here. And it's a long, long, long time ago. The history of the othering, which is the root issue behind climate change, is the dualism, is the split between mankind and nature. The very definition of nature is everything but mankind. So if you want to overcome that wound, that line of othering, not only we need to redefine nature, but we need to redefine men as well. But this is deep. This is 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years before Christ, sorry. This is the beginning of Neolithic agricultural revolution. So we, we've been here for a long time. We are the result of a very, very long chain of othering. And I think the last thing we should do is to other this history. We're part of it. So, as for any form of trauma, the first step is just to embrace. And from that acknowledgement of where we come from, evolve. Some people say, it's fine, it's almost sorted, it's only an issue of generational change. So, the young people get it right, as soon as the pale, male, and stale group of leaders will, will leave, we'll be all right, because the new generation gets it right. About 50 years ago, there was also uh, an incredibly important movement where the younger people got it right. And it was just about generational change. The civil rights movement achieved incredible things. But have we reached equality? So if it was just a generational issue, you know, we would be all right now. So my worry, my thought is actually, it goes a little bit deeper than just time. It's, it's not out there on the timeline, it's inside us somewhere. And I believe it has to do with consciousness. And by consciousness, let's just kind of agree on this, we refer to the state of being aware of or responsive to one surrounding. I'm here and I'm aware that I'm here with you and you're aware that you're here and you're aware that at some point I should be making sense. But it's about consciousness because our consciousness throughout the evolution of Homo sapiens has changed dramatically. We used to think that behind anything, behind the lake, behind the wind, behind the sun, there was a godlike power, a superhuman energy that made everything and anything work. And then we realized, oh, that's a bit too complicated and way too much gossip. We moved from a mythological consciousness to a theological consciousness. We're going back to the Abrahamic monotheisms. So behind everything, behind the sun, the wind, earth, planets, stars, there is one single God. And you may decide which, which your favorite God is. And then science, specifically, Galileo and, and, and other incredible um, discoveries kind of question the simplicity, yet the clarity, of this state of consciousness. And humans started to believe that, yes, it is all about humans having great ideals and pursuing such ideals, 
great things will be done. In the aftermath of the World War II, uh, specifically during the 50s, although this work started earlier, humans started to embrace a different uh, kind of consciousness. And when I refer to these changes in consciousness, this is not something that happens on a certain day of the month and before and after humanity is different. Of course, you know, the future is already here, but it's just not spread evenly. So psychological consciousness started to really um, provide a new framework for humans to understand their surroundings and to make sense of their surroundings and to make sense of their own existence. So the psyche, traumas, desires became the references for a new form of consciousness focused on the individual, focused on you and me, what we have in our head and what we carry with us in terms of trauma, desires, and aspirations. But we kind of realized that focusing the, on individuality was missing out a fantastically important element of being human, which is to relate, to empathize, to create relationships. So some thinkers now think that actually our consciousness is, is developing yet into another area, is a dramaturgical consciousness. Life is a show. We're on stage. Every single moment of our day is a performance. And we change the character we are performing according to the empathy and the energy that we exchange with our audience. Of course, this is not fixed like in the theater, but it's a metaphor to explain that we exist because we relate. We exist because we empathize. The main reason that humans can now dare to extend their empathic bond to the entirety of the planet is internet. Internet and the internet of things at that ever-increasing level of connectivity. But what's emerging is really interesting is that the more developed the IoT is, the more developed the internet of things, the more developed the social media network, the more developed the internet itself become, the more they start to resemble biosphere itself. So I'm starting to make sense now. And biosphere is the ultimate network with everything influences each other. Geology is linked to chemistry, is linked to biology, is linked to ecology, and so on and so forth. So everything is connected. There is only one source of energy, which is the sun. Everything else is transformed. So our question, really, as architects is, if the ultimate wound to heal is our dualism with nature, what is architecture? So I'll summarize this perhaps long intro on what consciousness means for architecture in, uh, in a little animation. So I've taken the audio out because it was horrendous, really. Um, so th this, this is nothing more than a sketch that we shared with a few friends. Peter received a copy of, I mean, uh, the link to it. Um, and it's nothing more than, than a comics um, strip. And the idea was, was really to summarize the complexity of this evolutionary human journey in a very simple um, cartoon. And after this, where we are now, we hope that we will get there. And the question is, if the purpose is to heal that wound, the dualism between mankind and nature, what is architecture? And by the way, I also wish you best wishes for 2020. <laughs> What is architecture? I'm an architect, but I, I am absolutely perplexed by what we produce. You know, is architecture our safe shelter? Is architecture a weapon of colonization? Is architecture a way to heal our environmental debt or to make it even harsher? 
because we don't know the answer, and really I'm here tonight, I'm filming this because we're going to start a series of this workshop exchange. So, you know, you know as much as I do. What, what is architecture? But we also use social media to, to engage uh, with a wider audience. Um, this campaign just started this week, and um, it's very simple. Um, it's got three components. The first one is a statement. All statements come from um, the IPCC report. So this refers to our prediction on climate change. Then, of course, there is a recurring question. What is architecture in this context? And the background is always an image coming from the history of uh, Beaux-Arts, the history of fine arts. Because I think we, we, we have a bit of an issue with the prejudice of moral superiority when we are confronted with high culture. We don't really understand that behind the expression of human culture in itself, there is that dualism, there is that wound, there is that othering that we need to heal. So we will have about 200 million climate refugees by 2050. How are we going to use architecture to solve this? Planet Earth has officially entered its sixth mass extinction. Just the numbers are everywhere. Bird, bugs, fish. What is architecture doing in this? 85% of the CO2 in the atmosphere has been produced since 1948. Kind of yesterday. And it was the built environment, the main conveyor of this explosion of CO2 levels. So we don't really know. But we are trying to engage with that wider allegedly empathic connection to find an answer. And perhaps my favorite one, not a single pledge of 2016 Paris Climate Agreement has been delivered yet. And our buildings, the stuff I've designed, is responsible for that. And as architecture is interlinked with infrastructure, we cannot ignore the fact that only at plus two degrees, we're really on the path for plus 3.2. 400 million people will suffer from water scarcity. What is architecture doing in this? If you feel, you can have a break now, and then we can look at some of the stuff we've done. If you want, I can just carry on. Tough, tough people, eh? All right. Um, so that question, what is architecture, you know, really kind of bugged us since the very beginning. And the very beginning looks something like this. So that's me a few years ago, and that's my business partner. Um, and there's 4,000 bricks. So this was a, um, you don't know this. Uh, this was a...